Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, as already mentioned, my name is Matthias Dignan, and I'm the product manager at CCS Europe. And today I would like to talk a little bit uh, about lighting as, key, as a key enabler in machine vision applications. So just to be sure that is me. Um, so before we start, we have to go, of course, into the essentials of lighting. Uh, and first I would like to talk about then, well, what is light? Uh, lighting is, in essence, electromagnetic radiation. What we view as visible light is between a uh, bandwidth of 400 nanometers up to 700 nanometers. And light, in essence, is uh, composed out of four different components. The first one, of course, being your wavelength. Well, the wavelength is uh, the distance until a wave starts to repeat itself again. So you have your top, you have your through, you get the repetition again. And that wavelength defines what, we, what color we perceive. So somewhere in the 400s, that is more blue, 660 is red, and then somewhere in the middle, we perceive as green. The following component is the amplitude. And that's quite easy. Amplitude is actually the height of the wave, and the higher the wave is, well, the more intense your light is. Then we follow that with direction of propagation, which is a fancy way of saying which way is your light going, left, right, up, down. And then finally, we have the plane of oscillation, which has to do with the ability of polarization, which I will get into a little bit later in the, in the presentation. Now, for us as CCS, as a lighting company, these components are very crucial when selecting a proper light source. And knowing these, how you then position your light source, will also have an impact of how you observe the interacted light on your uh, object because changing just one thing can have a lot of impact. If you change your illumination angle, you might not highlight the features that you want to see. If you have a too high intensity, you might obscure the things you want to see. Or if you use a blue light on a red object, well, probably chances are there that you will not see anything. So you have to take this into account when you're looking for your lighting solution. Because when light hits an object, things can happen. It can scatter, it can refract, you can change your optical, optical rotation. Um, so you really need to take into account these factors when selecting your uh, lighting solution. To give a 2D uh, representation of what could happen with two different light sources, here we have uh, a diffused light source with a direct light source. It's very simplified, of course, but when shining it on a flat, shiny surface or a rough surface, different things might happen. And this is only looking at a diffused light source, a direct light source, not taking into account different wavelengths, light working distance, etc. So how that then does that translate to your applications? And I would like to talk to you about a little bit about that through our flat dome technologies. Um, CCS flat dome lights use a unique technology where um, we have a very thin light, about 10 millimeters thick, and on the sides we have LEDs placed. Those LEDs shine into a light guide diffusing plates, uh, plate, and there we have a dot pattern printed on top of it. Now, as soon as that light hits those dot pattern, it uh, scatters downwards, creating a very diffused output. Sort of like a dome light, but also not like a dome light because you don't have the dark spot in the middle. Plus, since you don't have the circle, you can take into it, or you can use your complete field of view. So when you notice, what then happens when we use it on, a, on an object? And for this, we took a cam. Um, the date code is clearly visible. You don't have any surface roughness because of the diffuse light output. And well, you can see that it's a circular shape. So that's already good when looking at a cam. Now, of course, this is with a light working distance of only 10 millimeters. What then happens when you increase that light working distance to, for instance, 200 millimeters? Well, if you do that, you get a more, or you get a higher degree of parallelism in your light. And when that hits your object, you will observe different things. So looking at that same can, suddenly the circles in the middle, they become more apparent, and you can see that. You can actually now see a plastic wrapper, and you can also see that there's actually a defect there. So comparing the two to each other, depending on what you see, you might want to uh, change features of your light source and want to place it on a different uh, light working distance. Now, with this technology, um, you do have a printed pattern on the light guide diffusing the plate. That means that if you look at it, well, you can clearly see that. And sometimes it does show up in your acquired image. Um, you can sort of close your aperture or open up your aperture, but then you're working against your depth of field, and sometimes you can still see that pattern. So what we now did with the new technology is we don't print the, the dot pattern, but what we actually do is we laser engrave that pattern. And what that does, it makes the dot pattern almost non-visible in your acquired image. So for instance, we have here an older uh, LFX3. 
you can see the day code, and hopefully the projector will project it correctly, and you can also see here the, um, the dots. If we compare that then to the LFX V series, uh, our newest flat dome light series, the day code is clearly visible, but you don't see the dot pattern anymore. Now that's when you don't want to see your pattern, but sometimes it's actually beneficial if you want to see the pattern. Um, for this, we use the following technique. Instead of a dot pattern, we move to a stripe pattern or a line pattern. And this actually use, uh, you can use this with highly reflective mirror-like surfaces. What happens, again, um, the light gets uh, reflected into the shining surface and then directly backwards into your camera. So what you will see in your acquired image are the lines. That's if it's flat, highly reflective. But as soon as a dent or a scratch is introduced, that line pattern gets deformed. So thanks to that reflection, you can see that. And this is an example we can uh, show you the following, where in the middle, here, here, and here, you have three dots. Now to show again a little bit the difference between light working distances, this is one uh, with a one millimeter pitch version of the stripe pattern uh, pro product. And then here we have, with an increased uh, light working distance of 150 millimeters, one that has a two millimeter pitch uh, between the lines. And you can see, again, the dots are clearly visible. So depending on your application, depending on how much space you have in your, in your, in your machine, one might suffice over the other. And then the final uh, example of that is if we have a business card holder, um, it's metallic, highly reflective. Um, the owner of this business card holder is actually in this room. Um, what you see here is uh, we had dents and scratches that are visible here. And then with the two millimeter pitch version, you have them here as well. Of course, your light working distances, uh, distance will increase. And what we did that to replicate that also here is that, um, or not replicate, to show that here, is we didn't adjust the exposure time. See, well, look, your light working distance increased, so uh, you might get a darkened image. If you want to have an as light image as the above, then you have to, of course, increase your exposure time. So the following thing I would like to talk a little bit about is computational imaging. Um, we did a full presentation on this two years ago, um, so I will just briefly go over it. If you have any further questions, feel free to drop by our booth later on today. Um, first things first, of course, what is computational imaging? And computational imaging, as it says here, refers to the digital image capture and processing techniques that use digital computation instead of optical processes. This is actually just a very fancy way of saying you're taking multiple pictures, from those, you create a new one to feed into your image processor. And the best example that I can give you for that is actually um, a modern-day selfie. So you take your smartphone, you want to take a selfie, um, you have sunlight in the background, but you also want to have a properly lit face. And what happens when you push that button on your cell phone? It will take multiple pictures with multiple exposure levels, and then it puts them on top of each other, and bam, you have your perfect selfie with a well-lit background and also a well-lit face. And that's actually what we're talking about here. Putting that then into use in machine vision, we can, go, for instance, go to photometric stereo or shape from shading. Shape from shading or photometric stereo is a technique where you take four different pictures with four different illumination angles. And from those pictures, you can extract data and know where uh, depths and uh, know a little bit more about the surface. So as an example, we can give you this one, which is a, a carton flap with a barcode printed on top of it. There's also a LUT code on there, but you cannot really see that because, well, the barcode is in the way. The barcode also absorbs IR, so that makes it a little bit more difficult as well. So as mentioned, with photometric stereo, four images, four different illumination angles. So what we do then is we take a picture from north, east, south, and west. And then we can already see, well, different shadows are being casted and created. So from that data, we know, okay, maybe here's the LUT code. And if we put those four together, we can create this image where the barcode disappeared, but the LUT code is clearly visible. And this is just one of the examples that you can do with photometric stereo. Uh, there are others as well, of course. Um, for instance, the tire inspection. Uh, this we did with our LSS controller, which uh, powered four high-powered floodlights uh, of one meter each. It triggered them, and it also triggered the camera to make image acquisition easier for you. And you can see that uh, the code here is clearly visible. It's a very difficult application because you have black on black uh, surfaces, and usually that you know, isn't really easy to do with traditional machine vision hardware. 
You can also use it for staple removal um, if you don't want to see the print but do want to see the staples. And finally, you can also use it for glare removal if you don't want to use polarization. There are also some other techniques within computational imaging. Think about um, having a monochrome sensor and still getting a color image or um, extending the depth of field. Um, if you want to have more information on that, again, feel free to visit us after the presentation. So finally then, as promised in the beginning of the presentation, we will go to polarization. I will do a little bit about glare removal because I have to talk about that before we dive into some f more fun stuff, let's say. But there are some other presentations about polarization as well that will uh, handle this topic as well. So in essence, polarization. Uh, what you have is unpolarized light, it passes a polarization filter, and what it does, it only allows one plane of oscillation to pass through. Let's call that, in this case, horizontal. If you then do cross-polarization and you put a vertical polarization filter behind that, nothing will be able to pass and you won't see anything. And it's that thinking that we use with glare removal. So um, here we have a cigarette pack uh, with a plastic foil on top of it. But you can see here a lot of specular reflections, a lot of glare. Um, if you use non-polarized light. Now what happens if you use polarized light? We emit horizontally polarized light to that uh, object. The foil will, uh, or the plastic foil will directly reflect that horizontally polarized light to your camera, but there's another polarization filter there which will not allow it to pass it. But as soon as that polarized light, that horizontally polarized light, hits the particles of the carton package, the light will scatter and we will change the, pl the polarization degree allowing it to pass the polarization filter. And thus we can get this image where you can clearly see that, well, no glare is present there. Now if you take into account that scatter will change your uh, polarization degree, you can do fun things. So for instance, what we did here is we took one of our TH2 backlights. This is just uh, the 2D diagram of the setup. We took our 2H2 backlight, we put a sample, it's a liquid with uh, particles inside of them, lens with polarizer and a camera. Now, usually what happens when you uh, introduce non-polarized light as a backlight to uh, liquid, you sort of will see a particle. It's not really that visible, but in the middle we can, we can definitely distinguish that. But if we then do that with polarized light, well, we can already see here vertical polarization or cross-polarization, so we don't really see a lot uh, about the liquid itself. But as soon as that horizontally polarized light of, the, of our light source hits a particle, it scatters again, changing your uh, polarization angle, and it will show up uh, on your image. So as you can see here, a lot more particles become easier to detect within your liquid. You see on the top a little bit, on the bottom and in the middle. Same principle, different application. Still need to use polarized light though. Um, the final example that I would like to talk about a little bit is photoelasticity. And to talk about photoelasticity, I do have to talk a little bit about biofringence. What is biofringence? It's an effect that is exhibited by certain transparent materials. And what happens is uh, light enters the material, but it's got refracted twice by polarization. So you have two different refraction angles uh, and two components. Now, those two components, one of them will travel it doesn't travel slower per se, but it will take a longer time to pass through the material because it has a different refraction angle. And as soon as those two components then exit the material, you will have a phase shift between the two. That's biofringence, and let's apply that then to photoelasticity. Photoelasticity, um, and I see here that I missed something, but okay. Photoelasticity is where an object that doesn't exhibit biofringence in essence uh, normally does show that when it's under stress. And then if you use polarized light, you can see a complete color palette, uh, white polarized light, in your image sensor. The reason for that is um, those two components, both have a different polarization uh, angle. As soon as they hit the uh, polarization filter on your camera, they get, f um, they have get forced to combine into one polarization angle. But you have interference and you have a phase shift. So the interference can actually be, or can be either destructive or constructive. Destructive says it all, it will not pass the polarization filter, but constructive, it will, allow, uh, will be able to pass the polarization filter. And does show up on your image sensor. Now that phase shift uh, is equal for all different wavelengths, um, but uh, it is dependent on your stress angle. 
So a different stress angle, different phase shift. And we can exhibit that with the following sample. In Dutch, we call it a geodriehoek. I think in English, it's just a normal triangle. Uh, but we all went to high school, uh, and we all know this. So we cannot really change the stress angle in the subject, but we can change the angle of the geodriehoek. And what you can see here in the middle, you get a different color palette depending on your angle. And that's to simulate that the angle of stress will cause a different phase shift, and <coughs> thus different colors will show up. And that's the end of the presentation. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any further questions, then yeah, please feel free to do so.